you know me, I, I teach uh, at Central Connecticut State University. My focus is Connecticut history, but also maritime history. I do a really killer uh, uh, presentation on whaling and sailing ships. And th so if you're, if you're, I'd almost do that for free because I, I do this, I would do this for free. I just love talking. So anyway, all right. So we're going to talk about Hartford today. Um, and I think that when we start to think about Hartford and cities, um, to me, I, I think about why cities form and then, and then how things change over time. And I think today when we look at Hartford, obviously very different from where it was even 50 years ago, let alone 250 years ago. Uh, you know, today they're trying to decide, should we build a ballpark and, and do we improve the Civic Center and do we, are we trying to bring people in? Are we trying to keep people in? How do we pay for our services? Um, so all of that sort of ties into, I think, what we're thinking about as, as we're talking about, at least in my head it does. So, um, Okay, so we're looking at the history, growth, and development of our capital city. And I think, I think the reason Hartford continues to do as well as it does is because it is our capital. I, I think because, you know, the industrial base is gone and you know, lots of things are changing, but I think as long as the political capital's there, I, th I think that's a good thing. Okay, so if we could click on here. Uh, so we're going to look at Hartford, and you can just put up all, I think there's about five of them. Uh, Hartford is, it starts out as a farm community. It's settled because, well, the early settlements in Connecticut are on, in the river valleys, the navigable river valleys, and along the coast. And that's because there weren't any roads. So people travel meant that, uh, you know, by ship. Um, it's also really good farmland. Uh, relatively good farmland. And the, the third reason that, that the Europeans settled there is because there was lots of, uh, of, of grassy plains and even swamps where there was salt grass and hay and sedge that, and they, they raised cattle. And in England, when they saw that stuff, they knew they could, they had, they could feed their cattle for free. So it um, so starts off as a farm community. Uh, the, the, the three river towns, Hartford, Windsor, and Wethersfield, um, uh, becomes the political capital because when there are three towns, Hartford's in the middle. <laughs> and I think just from viewpoint of transportation, very often that's why p uh, places got chosen. Uh, you know, the, a lot of the, if you look at the Continental Congress was held in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania was right in the middle. There were, there were six colonies north and six colonies south. And so, so I, I think if nothing else, it just because it's in the center, it becomes the political capital originally. Uh, it's important uh, as a transportation link for a very long period of time. Uh, it's going to develop as a business center about the same time as Industrial City. But before we get to here, the population, Hartford is not, I think it's the seventh or eighth largest town because there are no cities in Connecticut. So it doesn't really start to take off population wise and economically until it starts to become a business center and then industry is really how the population explodes. So, all right. So we start with Native Americans and uh, the, the river tribes are the people that we're going to be talking about the most because they're the, they're the people that the, that the Europeans are going to encounter. Um, we have, the, the, there's a podunk sort of confederation or tribe that extends all along through here. Uh, and uh, we have the Tungsis Indians up here. We all know the Tungsis Indians, right? They named the community college. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, in Hartford it itself, they have the, the, the Sukiyog. Uh, this, they're a small sort of group of the river tribes and connected to the Podunks. And then the Nipmunk are up here. They're, not, they're less important, but, but they're all important because of the fur trade. And that's why the Dutch are going to come in originally. That's why the Europeans are going to come in originally because um, the, the furs that exist here do not exist in Europe. So. Uh, and then we have the Pequot. The Pequot are down here. The Pequot are controlling the fur trade, and that's going to make them extremely uh, important. And it's also going to mean that eventually they're going to, there's going to be a clash between the Pequot and the European settlers. You know, all wars are economic on one level or another, and, and the Pequot don't like the Europeans coming in and, and trying to control the fur trade, and the nat other Native American tribes prefer trading with the Europeans. So I think one thing leads to another, and we get the Pequot War. So. All right, so 1614, 400 years ago, right? 400 years ago this summer, last summer, uh, Adrian Block, uh, he, was, uh, he was actually a lawyer 
and uh, he had spent the winter on uh, Manhattan. Uh, this was even before the Dutch had purchased it. Um, and his men didn't want to spend the winter, so he had burned his ship. Oh, yeah, so, so they built another one. It's called the Unrest, or the Unrest was in Dutch. And, and in this I don't know, 65 or 70 foot vessel, he sails up the uh, East River through Hell's Gate and into, I forget what he called uh, Long Islands. I think he called it the Long Bay. And he's exploring and he's looking for a couple of things. He's looking for places to trade, Native Americans, and connect with them. But like all Europeans uh, 400 years ago, he was hoping that North America wasn't really large, that it was kind of smaller. There was some way to get through it or past it because everybody knew that the real wealth was in China and Japan and, and the East Indies. So, um, so he's going to sail up uh, the Connecticut River. He calls it the Fresh River, and that re represents his disappointment. Be, that it wasn't uh, the, the way to get through to, uh, to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, he's actually, as his ship is sailing, he's in, he's in a smaller vest, uh, a rowboat, really, and he keeps sampling the water and tasting it uh, for salt. And when he gets up around Essex, uh, it starts to be less salty. <laughs> and he realized it was just an estuary. It wasn't, it wasn't you know, a, 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 a channel of some kind. Um, so he calls it the Fresh River, which I think is, is, is shows his disappointment. Uh, he's going to sail all the way up to Enfield. Uh, he can't go past that because of the rapids there. Um, uh, on the way, he's going to stop in the area around Hartford, and he's going to trade with the Native Americans. Um, Europeans obviously had uh, metal pots and steel knives and things that, that they didn't place as much value on as the furs, and the Native Americans placed a lot of value on those things. So uh, most of the early trade, later on, the situation between the Europeans and the Native Americans gets pretty ugly, and there's lots of bad things happen on both sides. Early on, they're both really happy to deal with each other because the, there, there's that mutual uh, uh, benefit. Um, <clears throat> So in the 1620s, we see the Dutch and the English are trading in the River Valley, and they're trading with the Native Americans. 1633, the Dutch actually establish a trading post at what, where the Little River comes in. This is the, what do we call it, the Park River today, right? Okay. So at the, at the mouth of the Park River, they establish a, a, a trading post, and they call it the House of Good Hope. Um, all right, we can... Uh, at the same time, the Pilgrims in, over in Plymouth, they had their eye on the River Valley as well. And that same summer, the Pilgrims established a trading post just north of Hartford where the Farmington River comes in. Um, and uh, the smart thing the Pilgrims did is they realized the Dutch had already established their settlement and they realized the Dutch wouldn't be happy to have them come in. So what they did is they built a, a, the, the frame for a house and they cut the, the lumber for palisades. So when, the, uh, when the, the Pilgrims are sailing past the fort in Hartford, the Dutch saw them and they came out and they're waving their hands and they're yelling at them and they're threatening to fire their cannon. And, and of course the Pilgrims sail on past, they, they get to the... Uh, where they want to establish their settlement. Uh, and they quickly, within about three or four days, they had the house up and they had the palisade up. So about a week later, the Dutch decided they were going to go kick the, pure, the, the pilgrims out. And so they sent about 14 men and they marched up river. And when they got there and they saw the palisades, they realized that there, it wasn't just, they weren't finding people sleeping on the ground and they could overwhelm them and say, get the heck out of here. This is our, our territory. So, uh, so the, uh, the pilgrims and the Dutch, they, they worked together. The thing about the fur trade is most of it was up river. So the person that was the farthest north <laughs> had the best opportunity to trade. Anyway, so we know that, that in the next few years, uh, in the summer uh, or the winter 1634-35, we know there's a handful of people, they, they, they winter in Wethersfield, uh, which is why Wethersfield says, well, we're the first Connecticut settlement, right? Of course, Windsor says, no, 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 look, we got 1633, we're, we're, we're ahead of you. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the next year, uh, settlers come into Windsor. The next, the same year, a few people come to Hartford, but but uh, 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 Thomas Hooker doesn't come with his hundred people till 1636. So, uh, I always think of Hartford as 1636 being established, right? So Thomas Hooker. Thomas Hooker is a real interesting guy. If he'd stayed in Europe, uh, if he hadn't. If he hadn't been a Puritan and had those crazy ideas about religion and equality and things like that, um, he probably would have been a great minister in England. He was probably one of the great five or six creative minds. Uh, um, 
in, in England at the time. So the idea that he comes here to the New World and originally goes into Massachusetts Bay, that was a real coup. He was probably one of the top two intellectual and, and religious leaders. Um, so he's an author, an educator, a minister. Uh, one of the things he didn't like in Massachusetts is that if you weren't a full church member, you couldn't vote. And by being a full church member, you had to have that adult conversion, uh, which meant you could take communion, and that meant you were a full citizen. And, and if you weren't a full citizen in Massachusetts initially, you couldn't vote. And, uh, and uh, Thomas Hooker said that's wrong. The Christian community, all of us, the, 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 the community of believers, we're all equal citizens. Uh, and, and so uh, that's one of the things he disagrees with and uh, one of the reasons he's going to leave. He is the first minister of the Church of Cambridge. Uh, and, and so when he decides to leave, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's kind of a blow. But uh, leaders in Massachusetts, if you didn't agree with them, they didn't mind if you left. right? Uh, we, we think about them, you know, they were persecuted in England and, and they were seeking religious freedom for themselves, yes. Anybody else, no. The, the Quakers showed up and said, you know what, God loves us all equally. And they said, wow, these guys are really crazy and they, they couldn't wait to kick them out fast enough, right? So anyway, so uh, eventually Hooker's going to decide uh, to come to Connecticut. So he leads his uh, about 100 people through the wilderness following Native American trails in search of religious freedom, but also political freedom. So lots of people, when they look at early Connecticut history, they think, in the history of the development of, of democratic ideals, Connecticut certainly has, a, it's a very small part, uh, role that it plays, but it's, it's significant. So, and here's a, this was done about 250 years later, so it's just so historically inaccurate, it's, it's just awful, but it does show people wandering through the wilderness, so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, back in, these were actually buildings they constructed to celebrate, I think it was the 350th anniversary, and they took them down. Well, I, well, what's it? Are, 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 oh, you do, okay, all right. <clears throat> anyway, so all of the settlements in, in Connecticut uh, on the river, they were both sides of the river. So, so Hartford originally, the, the land that was Hartford was both East and West Hartford and Manchester. So, so uh, and Windsor was the same way. Windsor was both sides of the river, East Windsor, South Windsor, Windsor Locks, I think Ellington as well. Uh, and, and Weathersfield included uh, uh, Glastonbury. And so, so the three communities, they're really kind of like very long, elongated. Uh, um, anyway, so it, were established as a farming community. All the people uh, that uh, came, all of the Puritans, they were middle class farmers, which meant they were fairly well off. Um, most of them engaged in animal husbandry. They, they raised cattle. The problem was there were, no, there were no cows or horses or sheep or goats or pigs in the New World. So we had to bring them all over, which was kind of unpleasant. Have you ever been to Plymouth and, and seen how small the Mayflower is? Yeah, there were about, what, 10 or 12 pigs on board? Yeah, I can't imagine living in that small space with 100 people for three months, let alone with pigs, and yeah. Uh, anyway, so they're a farming community. Uh, they divide up the land. Early on, the, 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 they have the houses sort of in the center, and, and the land stretches out behind the houses, and that's, that's sort of the early style. The, one of the very first things they do is they build a meeting house. Uh, they didn't call it a church. It was, it, it, it had uh, uh, not just religious, but also uh, uh, secular uh, purposes. So on Sunday, uh, including Sunday night, you had services, but uh, throughout the week it was the town hall. If it was a town meeting you met there, it would be used as a school initially as well. Uh, so uh, one, of the, one of the myths about New England, we tend to think of you drive around to some of the old communities and you see the town green and the white clabbered congregational church and you say, oh yeah, that's 400 years old. No, that's about 200 years old. That's, that, that happened a lot later when, when, uh, for, for many, many reasons. But th this is what the original communities would have looked like. All righty. So this is our Hartford settlement in 1636. We can see here's the, the Little River, right? Uh, this would be downtown Hartford today. Oh, Front Street would be about here, right? Colts would be here, right? Civic Center, uh, probably about there. Um, but you can see the, the, the way the, the land, it's, it's sort of, it's very 
e elongated, right? So, so your property might be only 100 yards wide or so, but it might extend back a third of a mile. All righty. So river travel. River, river travel, the Connecticut River is not overly navigable, which is why today you don't see lots of docks in Hartford. You don't, if you go to New Haven or, or New London, you see big ships coming in and out and container ships and tankers and all of that. Um, the first place Long Island Sound is rather rocky and it's rather dangerous uh, to, to traverse. Uh, the Connecticut River, there are sandbars at the mouth of the river, and every so often, the Army Corps of Engineers, we, we dredge it out, but the sandbars are there because it's part of that natural estuarine, you know, the tide goes in and out, and, and so that's, there's not much we can do about that. As a matter of fact, when, when uh, uh, the Puritans were moving out of, out of Massachusetts into Connecticut, there was some consideration that there might be larger groups of people coming in and, and the leaders of Massachusetts Bay, they came down and when they got to the mouth of the river and they examined it, they said, this is never going to be navigable. This is never going to work. And, and especially when you're sitting in Boston, which is a very lovely port and very easy to access. Um, so that kind of kept the population down in some ways. Uh, Weathersfield was actually a key port. Uh, between Weathersfield and Hartford, there used to be some sandbars and some that have since been dredged out. But um, until 1692, Weathersfield was probably a more important port. Uh, but in 1692, there was a great hurricane and the Connecticut River shifted and they created an oxbow lake, which is the, the Weathersfield Cove, right? Um, so after that, it, it, was, it was much harder. It, Weathersfield stopped being a port, and eventually they're going to dredge the rivers to, to, keep, to be able for, for the ships to come through into Hartford. But, uh, but uh, trade is going to, as much as I say they're a farm community, trade with the outside world is important because, let's face it, there, you, you might grow all the food you want, but if you want dishes, uh, silverware, uh, fancy cloth, uh, tools of any kind, uh, you know, trade with the outside world is extremely important. All right. Uh, so Hartford becomes the political capital. Why? Because they're centrally located. Also because Thomas, Thomas Hooker is there. He's the, um, the religious leader, not just in Hartford, but really in, in the, in the, uh, within the, the river towns. It also becomes the largest town rather quickly. Uh, and in 1638, the three towns uh, are going to uh, send representatives in and they have the first general court, which would be the general court was, it was the legislature. It included the governor, but it also was a, actually a court system. So until maybe 150 years ago, you would actually, when the legislature met, if you were suing someone, you might end up going to Hartford and pleading your case. Uh, I think until at least the 1840s or 1850s, all divorces were heard by the general court, which that's okay when there's not a lot of divorces, right? <laughs> Today, it, it just, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work very well. Um, so anyway, this, this, I think this is supposed to be Hooker and, uh, and uh, Hooker's putting together the fundamental orders, right? We know about the fundamental orders, the first constitution. All right, is, is that even next? Okay. Um, so for the next hundred years, Hartford is largely a farm community. It's a growing farm community. Um, it's growing for a couple of reasons. The, the most obvious is that in, on a colonial farm, your workforce was your family, right? So uh, if, if you want to have people to work the land, you had lots of kids, right? Uh, and that worked really well, but when your kids uh, got older, they needed a place to, 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 they wanted their own farmland because they were raised to be farmers, which is why where we see, you know, towns like uh, Farmington, which as you know, included a vast area on this side of the ridge, um, people started to move out slowly into other communities. And so Connecticut grows, it grows pretty quickly population wise. So what we're going to see is, is a variety of people, not just farmers, but artisans, you know, people, uh, leather workers and, and, and various uh, metallurgy works, you know, silversmiths, things like that, uh, and shopkeepers, because it's gonna be a fairly busy port. Uh, in the colonial times, if you had a ship that was 50 feet long and drew like 10 or 12 feet of water, you could make a pretty good living uh, carrying stuff back and forth. Um, 
you can't do that today. If you look at the ships today, they, they have those giant, uh, you know, container ships. So Hartford's a fairly busy port, but it's still a farm community, even though we have an awful lot of other things going on. Uh, and as of 1665, Hartford became the co-capital with New Haven. Uh, and the reason for that is New Haven had been a separate colony originally. And um, because of the English Civil War uh, and when, uh, when Charles II was, uh, was restored to the English throne, he had been fighting against the Puritans and the Puritans had been the ones that had beheaded his father. Uh, here we are, a Puritan colony here in Connecticut. We didn't have a charter. Right. We had permission from the people in Massachusetts who had a charter to come down and settle here, but that was kind of uh, 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 tenuous. And we thought, you know, if, if Charles II really wanted to give us a hard time, he could say none of your laws are valid, none of your marriages are valid, none of your property claims are valid, all of your children are illegitimate because none of your marriages. So they, they, he could have made a, 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 given us a, a great deal of difficulty. Uh, so what we did is we sent Fitz John Winthrop to, uh, to England. We sent him because he knew a lot of, he knew who to bribe, right? Because in England, well in government usually knowing the right person and knowing whose palm to grease is the way that you get through the door, right? So, so anyway, Fitz John Winthrop had gone to, uh, to uh, back to England and got, a, got our charter, the Charter of 1662. So people in New Haven wanted their own charter and they had asked Fitz John Winthrop to, uh, they said, when, before you leave, come see us and we'll give you a big bag of gold to bribe people and then you can, you can get two charters. Well, he didn't do that. And the charter that he got said that the, the northern border of Connecticut was the, mass, the line of Massachusetts Bay and the southern border was Long Island Sound. And that meant suddenly that New Haven, which was really about five or six communities, was part of, of Connecticut. And the, the other four communities that made up the New Haven colony quickly agreed to just join into Connecticut. New Haven said no. We, we don't, we're, they thought that their form of Puritanism was better than their form of Puritanism. Every, it's, the world doesn't change, does it? Um, so at any rate, at the same time, uh, 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 Charles II, his brother James, the Duke of York, he had been granted all of the land between the Delaware River and uh, the Hudson River, so the, the colony of New York comes into being, and, and uh, James, who was, well, Church of England is Episcopalian, which the Puritans don't like, and James is married to a Catholic woman, which is almost like dancing with the devil. So uh, James said, you know, if they don't want to be a part of Connecticut, that's okay. I'll just make them part of New York. And that scared them. <laughs> and they said, but they wanted something. And so, so the idea was, yeah, we'll join you, but we want to retain some power. So the idea was that they were established as a co-capital. So in the, I think the even years you'd meet in Hartford and the odd years you met in, uh, in New Haven. And that worked when the legislature only met for a few weeks in the spring and a few weeks in the fall. And being the governor meant you could still run your farm or your business. <laughs> Just had to show up every so often and sign something. Um, you know, we didn't even have proper buildings. They would meet in, uh, in taverns or uh, lodging houses or things like that. So anyway, so this is going to work for... Well, well, it's gonna last for almost 200 years, right? So anyway, that's the co-capital. The West Indies trade is going to be important almost from the beginning and for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is that if we're talking about these small 50 or 60 foot ships, even 30 foot ships, um, those are really good for the coasting trade. You can hug the coast and, and get down to the Indies pretty quickly. You don't wanna take a small vessel like that out in the Atlantic. Um, for one thing, you're not going to be able to carry enough stuff to make the trip valuable. You know, I always tell my students, I said, if, if you were trading stuff with California, would you, would you want to do it in a Volkswagen or would you want to do it in a tractor trailer truck? And you figure out by the time you spend all the time and energy and, and fuel and all that, the larger vessel, the better. So, so we here in Connecticut, we're not trading a whole lot with England, but we discover that trade with the West Indies, almost anyone can do it. A 30-foot 30 30 vessel, you wouldn't need a lot of money. Uh, you know, a few of us, we could get together here in town and we could probably have one built and, and we could start, get, get involved in the trade pretty quickly. Um, so in 1649, the people of Wethersfield, or some of the people in Wethersfield and some of the people of Hartford, they pool their money, they build a, this little ship, they call it the Trial. You know, trial like with an eye, like we're testing to see if this is going to work. Uh, and, and this is the first, uh, first uh, uh, time that we start to trade with the West Indies. Um, the West Indies that we call in the Sugar Islands, um, 
Sugar was so profitable that no one in the Indies wanted to raise anything else. They wanted to, they didn't grow their own food. Uh, they didn't have anything they needed that wasn't sugar they had to import. So uh, that meant where we have a lot of farmers that are growing vegetables and grain and things like that. Um, we, we could always trade uh, foodstuffs with them. Uh, 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 the people, we, we didn't do a lot of cod fishing, but the people in Massachusetts made a killing uh, trading for, for codfish and things like that. So uh, timber, if, they, if someone wanted to build a house, they, they, they would buy the, the, the wood would be imported. Uh, animals of all kinds, so uh, this would be sheep and goats, uh, cattle. They had mules to turn the old cane presses, uh, <coughs> horses. Uh, even barrel staves. You know what barrel staves are? The, the slats. Yeah, I, used, I have to explain that to 19 year olds because they're like, <laughs> barrels? What are barrels, right? That's right, yes. Yeah, it, it's, yeah, it's a metal container that's full of beer. Yes, okay. Um, if you're a farmer and, and you know, over the winter, if you have a little spare time, you can go out and sit in your woodshed or your barn and you can just make yourself a few hundred barrel staves. And in the sp you know, when, when you go into town to trade, you're not only trading the vegetables or some timber, but you, if you have a hundred barrel staves, a ship's captain will take them. He'll, he'll pay them. He'll buy them from you because he knows he can make a nice profit, right? Um, the animals are interesting because if you can imagine, you have, we have a 35 or 40 foot vessel and we want to ship, uh, say, a dozen cows down. You're not going to get the cows below decks, right? So it's going to look like Noah's Ark. Below decks, you're going to have the, 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 the silage for the animals to eat. So I'm pretty sure an awful lot of these animal, the, the, these, these uh, ships sailing to the West Indies with, with, with cows and horses and pigs and sheep on the, on the main deck, it must have been pretty interesting, right? Uh, anyway, about, by the 1660s, what England figures out is they don't want the colonies competing with any of the uh, economic activity of the mother country. So for example, in England, there's a lot of farmers growing wheat. They pass a law that says you can't sell, you can't grow wheat in the Americas and then sell it in, in Europe, right? You can grow wheat and sell it down here because they need it desperately. So uh, they start to pass the Navigation Acts, which limit what we can do and trade with, with Europe, but that just encourages us more and more to trade with, with, uh, with the West Indies. And the West Indies, uh, can you imagine a world without sugar? You, you realize we all eat about a pound of sugar a week, we eat about, you know, and then a, probably a similar amount of, uh, what is it, corn sweetener? Yeah. Um, yeah, the first people that figured out sugar, they had it. Oh. Yeah. Anyway, so you grow sugar and then you're going to process the sugar and you're going to get molasses out of it, right? Now, again, you all know what molasses are. I have to explain that to 19 year olds because they're like, what? Um, and then, of course, you can process the molasses and you can turn it into rum. But so. You don't have to explain that. No, <laughs> no, they, yeah, they get that, but there, there's still the idea that it actually comes from somewhere. You know, I think I always say the problem with living in the modern world is you think uh, breakfast comes from the grocery store. Yeah, and then you explain, well, see, people raise cows, and then, they, you know, you walk into McDonald's, you order a cheeseburger, and it's only a buck. How do they do that? I mean, you figure the the meat and the bun and the cheese and all the vegetables and transportation and processing and labor and all of that and they, they and then they, you buy it for a dollar. It doesn't taste very good either but anyway so the navigation acts are going to be even more uh, uh, um, motivation for us to trade with the Indies and what we're going to see is capitalism in action. Capitalism is all about capital accumulation. So you, 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 you have a small mercantile here in town and, and you're take, getting goods on credit and you're trading with the farmers and in a few years you actually have a little bit of cash left over and you and another person you invest in a 30-foot vessel and then you know as, as it grows. Uh, so uh, essentially what you're finding is, is, is the vessels are getting bigger, the voyages are getting uh, uh, more frequent uh, and, and that's uh, an awful lot of the money that comes from this is going to be used when people decide to go whaling, you know, the, uh, the, the capital. Uh, and, then, and then from whaling, we're going to see a lot of that money goes, goes into the early insurance companies and banks and, and uh, 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 
textile mills and things like that. So, so this, is, this is a key first step. So the coasting vessels, they're very small, they're very easy to build, they're easy to navigate. Uh, if I'm sailing a big ship to England, I might make two, two trips a year if I'm lucky and the weather's good. If I'm coasting down here, I can do that in about six weeks. So uh, <clears throat> it's... What's that? How big were the crews of those? You could probably do it with four or five people, yeah. Yeah, so if I have a couple of sons uh, and then we hired, a, you know, one of the neighbor kids, we could probably handle it because there's, there's, I, I don't, I, I don't think they were, you know, the four and a half rigged sh ships you can handle really easily. The, the square rigs you have to get up and, and raise and lower the sails. So uh, I would say if you're doing just a four and a half, you could probably do it with two or three people really easily because you need a couple, there are times you might need two or three people to go aloft. So I, I, if I only had two sons, I might bring along a couple of other people as well. But see, the advantage is that if, 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 if you came along with me, uh, you might bring your own stuff to trade. You know, so very often uh, the crew would have, you know, you, you might have some pocket knives or things like that that you'd trade with people and make a little bit of money as well. So it, it, it was, uh, it, plus you get to travel, you know. All right. So uh, at, at any rate, what's happening is the merchants, the local merchants are becoming traders and they're investing in, in, in ships. So anyway. So in the next 40 or 50 years, uh, what we're going to see is, is, is Hartford becomes more of a mercantile center. Uh, there are more and more, uh, 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 the population grows. It's just about 5,000 in this time frame. Um, we're going to see uh, uh, lots of activity. If you look at, uh, uh, if you look at uh, paintings or, or, or images of Hartford, even say the 1840s, there, there was a real active uh, dock system you know, all along, uh, you know, where now they have a science center and, and all the bridges and all that. You know, today, if you, if you look, it, it runs right up to the river. It used to run down to the river, and there were, there were lots and lots of docks, lots and lots of ships coming and going all the time, right? Uh, today, it's tractor-trailer trucks, right? <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, some of the more valuable products that are being moved, drugs, and we're not talking about like, uh, uh, you know, Lipitor and things like that. We're talking about uh, 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 herbal medicines and stuff like that. Um, wine and rum, these are real high value products that are, that are valued. Um, there's a lot of things today you can, you can get for free or, or buy really inexpensive. You go to McDonald's and just grab a handful of pepper and walk out for free, right? Uh, 400 years ago, that amount of pepper you, you could have probably bought a house with because pepper was something like $50 an ounce. Back when it was way out in the West Indies and, and getting there and back was dangerous and expensive and it just took a really long time, right? Okay, uh, by this time we're starting to see weekly stages uh, running between Boston and New Haven coming through Hartford. Uh, it only took, I think it took three or four days to get to Boston on the stage. Um, 1774, the population is only about 5,000 people, actually sixth, I think Farmington was the largest. I think Farmington had seven or 8,000 people. And then, and then slightly ahead of uh, New Haven and New London were, were much bigger. New London was a lot bigger, but then Groton broke off. And so, and that often happens. If, if you look at the population of a community, it's like it's growing up and then suddenly it's like, wow, how did they lose a third of their people? Oh yeah, well, uh, you know. Uh, Anyway, uh, and this happens in 1783 when e East Hartford breaks off. So, uh, and East Hartford concluded Manchester, so Hartford was kind of cut in half there. All right. So in 1775, we have 73 towns, which is on 69, that's not even half, right? Uh, only six counties. Uh, Middlesex County did not exist, and Tolland County did not exist, but otherwise you have Litchfield and uh, Fairfield and Hartford and New Haven and uh, New London and Wyndham, right? Uh, Connecticut at this time though is dominated by Eastern Connecticut because it's still, we're talking about farmland. This area is heavily settled. The farmland out here is really terrific. Uh, this area is only beginning to be settled because it's so rocky and hilly. Uh, and as a matter of fact, a lot of the people that moved in here early moved up in this area because of the iron that they found there. You know, we had a fairly active uh, 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 iron uh, uh, industry going on until probably about 1840 or 1850. All right. 
So the city of Hartford in 1784, this is after the revolution, there's a city designation given to five communities and they were the five largest trading communities, I think, New London, Middletown, New Haven, Norwich, and Hartford. Uh, I've never understood the city designation because the cities, sometimes the cities are not the same as, like uh, Groton, there's Groton City, there's Groton, which is this big, and then part of Groton is Groton City, which is this big. <laughs> um, it has to do with, with administration. Um, but we're going to see, like, it, it, till it, before 1859, the city of Hartford and the community of Hartford didn't have the same boundary. That in 1859, uh, it was decided that the city and town would have the same boundaries. But they still had separate governments. And, which is why I think getting back here, I think the city designation means you, ha you have a separate government for that. So, uh, and, and by 1896, we see that, that separate governance, it, 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 uh, it, uh, we just have the, the city government, the, the, the town government disappears. So um, <clears throat> after the revolution, um, there was a desire as, as, as business continues to grow, uh, there was a desire to build roads. Um, the federal government was broke. And besides, back then, nobody thought the federal government should be investing in the states, right? Um, the, the, the state of Connecticut was broke because we had uh, developed a, a rather large uh, a war debt that we were trying to pay off. Uh, so it was left to the communities to try to build roads. And, uh, and what they did from colonial times, they had... Um, I can't think what it was called, but it was, it was like in the Middle Ages where you had to work for the, the, the Lord, like, yeah. Uh, essentially, if you lived here in Simsbury, uh, uh, all the men, once a year, they had to work one or two days on the roads. And back then, the roads weren't paved or even gravel. That just meant going out and maybe clearing trees and brush and things like that. Um, so if, if you can imagine when you're relying on people you know, it's my turn to go out, but I don't really feel like going, so do I really go out or do I show up and like drink coffee all day? You know, so, uh, so it wasn't a very good system is what I'm trying to say. So um, it's decided as, as, as the, as the uh, business centers are starting to grow, especially between the cities, uh, that it's a good investment to build turnpikes and turnpikes are just what you, they're toll roads, right? Um, so one of the early uh, 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 turnpikes is the Hartford New Haven and what you have is businessmen in Hartford and businessmen in New Haven getting together. They petition the legislature uh, for a, a, a charter. Today if you want to incorporate you just go to the Secretary of State's office and you fill out about 305 forms and you pay a lot of money and sooner you, back then you actually had to, to petition the legislature and tell them exactly what you're doing, who your investors were and the charter would say this is how much money you can raise, this is what you have to spend it on, you, you can only make, you know, the, the, your, your profit margin can only be so much so um, at any rate. Uh, so you have investors, so the, the people in Hartford and New Haven, they decide to invest. They're hoping two things. Number one is that the transportation between the two communities is going to build the, uh, the trade and, and, and business in general, right? Uh, but also they're hoping that they're going to make money because lots of people are going to be paying the tolls, right? So, uh, so the, the, the turnpike here, it lasts about 30 years or so. And here in Connecticut, I think we charge about 104 turnpikes. A lot of them still exist. Um, trying to think of one around here. Litchfield the Litchfield Turnpike, sure, yeah. And that's that actually. Well, it's kind of 44. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the turnpikes, they, they actually, early on, it's, most of the turnpikes are only 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 miles long because it was, it was about $1,000 a mile to build. You know, so you really had to generate an awful lot of money to do that. Uh, eventually what happens is, especially after about 20 or 30 years, turnpikes aren't making any money. <laughs> and the state is badgering the companies, you know, you, you got to put, you got to improve the roads. And the people are saying, why are we going to put money? So they, they ab either abandoned them or they gave them back to the state. So a lot of times, um, you know, there's a turnpike that runs essentially Route 69, which runs out of New Haven and all the way up to what, Litchfield or beyond. That was actually about three or four separate turnpike sections. 
that that were run by different companies that that eventually just became you know one one road there so uh, the first turnpike is, is it connects to Boston and that's really just that's that doesn't really go to Boston but there's a number of roads that connect that run up that way uh, Hartford Norwich that's one turnpike system Hartford New Haven that's what 28 29 miles Hartford New London is more like 35 miles um, so you can see just like spokes radiating out going uh, on to generally the um, the population centers and if you notice none of the population centers are up in this area because this area is still rather sparsely settled it still is today if you if you ever drive out there you go up to the Goshen Fair and if it's yeah you get really out there there's more trees than people right all right uh, railroads are going to be the next big thing Railroads, I think, they represent two things. There's a technological advance, but there's also a capital accumulation because railroads are going to cost about 10 times what a turnpike does. So if the Hartford and New Haven turnpike costs $30,000, the Hartford and New Haven railroad is going to be about $300,000. Now that money didn't exist in 1798. You couldn't have raised that much money. By the time we get to the 1830s, the, 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 it, the, it's a possibility, right? So. Uh, the early railroads looked like this. Uh, this is, you have what, uh, cinders and smoke and ash. It was not uncommon for people's hats to catch on fire. Um, you're also, if you can see, these are just stagecoaches and the, the spring systems on these are very often, they're like whalebone or, or leather. So the ride isn't very good uh, and they tip over pretty easily. So if you get going more than about five or six miles an hour, uh, it's it's easy to fall off, um, but it's quicker, you know, to, to take, well, if you're taking the Hartford New Haven Turnpike and you're traveling, but if you're riding a horse, you might get there in about half a day, take a wagon maybe, you know, it's, it's about as fast as a person walks, right, <laughs> three miles an hour. Uh, this sucker gets going five, six, seven, eight, ten miles an hour, and it scares the heck out of some people, but for a lot of people, it's, Wow, look at what technology is doing for us, right? Uh, eventually what they do is they start building separate uh, uh, train cars, uh, but they don't, they have seats just like you do. They're, they're not bolted down. So if you can imagine you're sliding along and then you tip over, right? And then people complained that it was cold in the winter time, so they'd put, they'd put a pot belly stove in the corner. They didn't bolt that down either. <laughs> Stove would tip over, the car would catch on fire, people would be, it just, it was, yeah. The other thing is they, they didn't, very often the track, you, you said one track, and so you had to know very carefully like what time it was in various communities. And until the 1880s, that wasn't really standardized. Um, here in Connecticut, we had a problem because uh, Eastern Connecticut was really on Boston time. And, and Western Connecticut was on New York time, and they're actually about eight or nine or 10 minutes apart. Uh, so that was a problem. And then the other problem was, well, here in town, you'd, you'd have uh, maybe the library, maybe the congregational church, maybe the town hall would have, keep the official time, right? And the clock would run and, they, and they'd keep, you know, so, uh, but you know, if it was, you know, 1215 here in Simsbury, the clock in Farmington might say, you know, 12, 12, 10, might say 12, 17. So if you're trying to say, okay, the train is leaving at a certain time and it's coming north, it has to get in by a certain, you know, well, th there are all sorts of problems with that. So early on, there are a lot of horrific accidents. Um, you know, train, even though they're only going six or eight or 10 miles an hour, when they, when they run into each other and the seats aren't bolted down and the things catch fire, um, and it's really bad for business when people see in the newspaper that people are using your service and it's killing them, right? So, yeah. Um, anyway, but, but what we see again with, with the, the same as with the, uh, the turnpikes, we see that, that a, a, a system, a complex system is going to develop. And again, they're all short systems because no one company can afford to build big systems. But over time, they're going to incorporate. Uh, the largest incorporation we're going to see is along the coast where we see the uh, early on the Hartford and New Haven Railroad is going to merge with the New York and New Haven Railroad. It's going to become the Hartford, New York, New Haven Railroad. We're just going to call it the New Haven Railroad for a really long time, right? And you probably remember when they went bankrupt in the 50s and then it was always like, they, they never told a story about the, the railroad. It always was the bankrupt New Haven Railroad, right? And my friends and I, we just called it the bankrupt. We say, I'm taking the bankrupt on Saturday to New York, right? 
Um, at any rate, so we can see the same thing. Uh, Hart, uh, New Haven, Springfield, eventually this joins together, right? Uh, Hartford, Providence, and Fishkill is one of the two <coughs> railroads that ran east and west. Um, there's a couple of reasons for this. Early on, while they had the, the technology to do this, they didn't have the technology to build bridges. Uh, the other thing is, especially because of the Metacomet Ridge here, it's real hard to put a railroad through on relatively flat land. Um, and the Hartford, Providence, and Fishkill that actually runs, if you take 84, like right through Plainville, kind of go through the notch, yeah. It actually went right through, the, that's one of the few places. The other place, of course, is up in Terrafil, right, where the Farmington River goes through. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's probably the 1860s, 1870s, before they built the first real good bridge over the, uh, the Connecticut River. Because it used to be what you you'd take the train up and when you got into Saybrook, you'd get off the train and you get on a ferry and you ride the ferry boat across and then they'd ferry the train cars across. They put the train back together and then you get on the train and you'd go all the way to New London and you get off the train and you take the ferry across the Thames River. That took a really long time, right? Um, the other thing the railroads did is, is they made, uh, uh, it was rather difficult if you're sailing from Boston and coming down to New York. Uh, for one thing, along the coast of Cape Cod, the currents are pretty bad. They're going the wrong way. Uh, coming around Point Judith, especially if you're coming into, into uh, the Long Island Sound, it's really dangerous. So when they could get, when you could actually take a railroad from, say, Boston, Providence, down into Connecticut, and then sail, either take a steamboat or whatever, and sail out, that, was, that worked pretty well. As a matter of fact, the first railroad in Connecticut was a six-mile railroad that ran into Stonington. It was right here. And that's because people coming from Boston would come down and they'd get into Stonington or London and they'd take steamboats or sailboats and, and, and go on their way. Connecticut Valley Railroad runs right along the Connecticut River, runs down to Saybrook. People, this represents, all these other are going to like uh, industrial centers or, or business centers. This is going to the beach. By this time, people realize that, hey, it's pretty nice in the summertime to get down to the beach because you get those ocean breezes. And so, uh, yeah, this is more about, about people. Uh, but again, by this time, people are starting to have a little bit of free time, a little bit of spare money and all that. So anyway, those are railroads. Oh, well, this just shows our railroads. And it's, it's, I, I almost deleted the slide because I, I find it somewhat uninteresting. Well, for you, because see here's Terrafil, you have, you have the line that runs up here, right? Okay. All right, then we get steamboats. Steamboats actually are, are about the same time uh, as the uh, as turnpikes. The first steamboat is built by John Fitch. John Fitch was from East Windsor. Um, looks something like this, right? The steam engine is 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 cranking like this, and it's running these arms, and the arms are making the oars go back and forth, right? Um, <clears throat> he actually tested, it, I think, on the Delaware River by near Philadelphia. Uh, and he was quite sure that the federal government was going to say, wow, that's the greatest thing I've ever seen, and, and they were going to buy it from him. And they said, eh. Uh, he eventually, he's going to, he, he meets Robert Fulton in Europe. Robert Fulton uh, actually builds the first successful steamboat, uh, the Claremont, and he's going to test it running up and down the Hudson River. Steam power is, is a revolution because... When you're sailing, if you're going downriver, it's pretty easy because that's the way the current's going. Right? Uh, trying to get upriver, you have to figure out how to tack against the breeze and all of that. The steamboat means you don't care which way the current's going, you don't care what the wind is doing, as long as you have the, the proper channel that's going to work, right? So, so early on, because Fulton is testing this, the first real steamboat companies are going to evolve in and around New York and uh, New Jersey and Connecticut and... Uh, uh, um, Cornelius Vanderbilt gets in this really early because about this time he has, he has, he's rowing people across New York Harbor. Right? And when the steamboats come along, he thinks this might be a good thing to get into and he eventually becomes extremely wealthy, right? Okay, so by 1812 we see there's, there's service from New York to New Haven. And again, uh, when the railroad gets built eventually, you're, 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 it's hard to get up the Connecticut River. So there, there is some steamboat travel, but, but it's easier for people to come into New Haven and then, and then take the train or before the train even the, uh, uh, the stage. And we're going to see regular service developing to Boston. So this is going to be extremely, is the next, the next slideshow Hartford and uh, 
yeah, this is, th this shows us alo along the, the river here, you can see all the different docks. Right, so if, if we were in Hartford 200 years ago, again, we would probably see lots and lots of masts. We wouldn't see the bridges and a lot of, certainly not the Phoenix building and all that. And this is, I'm not sure if this is supposed to be Hartford or just a representation of a really, uh, really uh, busy uh, community here. But you can see there's no, it just, it runs right down to the, uh, to the ocean, to the, uh, the, the river. Yes, okay. <coughs> so we get the Connecticut Steamboat Company. Is this the Hartford? I think it's the Hartford. Eventually they figured out that having the oars do this, if they, if they actually put on, it's called a walking board, it goes back and forth, and it actually start, turns a wheel and that's much easier because you could, in the wheel, you could make the paddles as wide as you wanted to, right? So, so this is, this is uh, called a side wheeler. Eventually they go to the stern wheeler, which works even better. The stern wheeler, what they did, here the steam engine is here, the stern, stern wheeler, what they did is they put it back here and they turned it sideways. And it would, yeah, all right. All right, the Connecticut Steamboat Company is chartered in 1819. Um, one of the things they have to, to create is a steam tug which operates down to Saybrook. And again, that's because of the, uh, of the problems of navigation in the river and especially in and around Saybrook. Uh, they did run upriver to Northampton. The, the reason they could do that is the steamboats, they didn't, have a, uh, they didn't draw a lot of water so they could actually, at certain times of the year at least, they could, they could get across the, uh, um, <coughs> the rapids. Uh, generally speaking, though, early on, you, you're going to see combined stage and steamboat service. Uh, so you might take a, a stage to New, to New Haven, and then you might take the steamboat to New York. You then might take a stage to Philadelphia, and so on. So you, you might have five or six legs of your trip if you were going, say, as far as Washington, D.C. So here's a daily canal boat. Well, we're not going to talk. You all know the Farmington Canal, right? Good. Okay. Uh, so here's a... You have the, the canal boat line, uh, uh, steamboat and steamboat to Cheapside, right? Uh, so, so here's a good example of from here we get to New Haven. Uh, hi there. Hi. Not really. And then here's the New York and Boston steamboat line via Hartford, right? Uh, the Oliver Ellsworth, do we all know Oliver Ellsworth? Supreme Court Justice was uh, one of the founding fathers. Oh. We'll have to do a presentation on Oliver Ellsworth. He's, he's one of our, one of the great Connecticut, sons of Connecticut. Um, leaves New York Tuesdays and Fridays, leaves Hartford at 11. And I believe it only took about 12 hours to get to New York. So, which if you were taking a stage, it would take three times as long. Okay. Uh, and then the Connecticut River Company, uh, this ties in indirectly, or really rather directly to the, uh, the Farmington Canal. The Farmington Canal was built because um, Hartford and New Haven were competing economically with each other. And um, the canal is built because what the people in New Haven think is that if they can run the canal straight up to Northampton, Massachusetts, you won't have to sail all the way over the Connecticut River and all the way back up to Hartford. Uh, but you can get right up to Northampton and avoid the, the, uh, the uh, rapids at, at Enfield. So, uh, so initially, well, the canal never made money. We, we know that, right? It was a fiasco for a number of reasons. But the people in Hartford got concerned that what if it really happened? So they decided that if they could build a canal, uh, a short canal, about six miles around the rapids at, uh, at, uh, at, at you know, Windsor Locks, right? Uh, up to, uh, where does it go up to? Warehouse Point, right? Warehouse Point was called Warehouse Point because if you were sailing down the river, you would stop, you would unload your stuff, you'd put it on wagons, you'd put it in a warehouse, and then they'd carry it down six miles, and then they'd sail the boat safely down over, and then they'd reload it. So <clears throat> anyway, so this whole idea of, the, of, the, end of the, the, the canal built by the Connecticut River Company was supposed to uh, compete with the Farmington River and mean that people that wanted to trade up river weren't going to use the Farmington Canal. So all right. Yeah, they, yeah, they, they, they built this six, six and a half mile uh, little canal there. Have we been to Windsor Locks? There's a nice uh, hike bike trail there. Yeah. All right. So 1829, the Farmington Canal opens, what, 1828? Yeah, 1828. Uh, <clears throat> it's called the Enfield Falls Canal. It's four and a half miles long. The idea is to circumvent the rapids here. Um, 
basically when you're shipping stuff, anytime you have to handle the freight, it's expensive. Because if you put it on a ship and you sail it along, if it takes two or three days or five or six days, it's not costing you that much. But you stop and suddenly you have to get 20 people unload the ship and then you gotta have, put it on wagons and you gotta carry it four or five miles and then you have 20 people reloaded. That's really expensive. And anytime you train ship stuff, it's, it's the, the price goes up, right? Um, <clears throat> So it's going to improve the transportation north, and the idea is to compete with the Farmington Canal. The interesting thing is I think this cost almost as much as the Farmington Canal, and they actually were able to build it, and it actually functioned for a very long time. Yeah. All right, then we get to industrial development. Um, as late as the 1820s, the population of Hartford wasn't that big, but we're going to see industrialization is, is what's going to cause the population to boom. Because if we're all farmers, if we all need a couple of acres to, uh, of land, and, and Hartford's only so many square miles, you're never going to get a whole lot of people in there, right? Uh, but, you know, t today, well, how many people in Hartford today are farmers? How many of us are farmers, right? Yeah, we all think breakfast comes from the, from the supermarket, right? So uh, one of the problems with Hartford is there's limited water power. A lot of the early mills we're going to see uh, in the Quinnebog River Valley and in the, uh, in the Naugatuck River Valley because the rivers are narrow and you have a lot of water power, and that's what you need. A big, a big wide river that, that doesn't flow very quickly is a terrible place to build a mill. Um, so we have limited water power. So it's after 1815 when they start uh, developing big enough and, and safe enough steam engines uh, that, that can run uh, at least small factories uh, that we're going to see Hartford begin to take off, which is why the population is going to double between 1820 and 1840, because if you're working at Colts or at uh, you know, the Hartford uh, uh, the nail factory, you're not raising your food, so you don't need your family to be living on a couple of acres, right? All right. So Hartford slowly becomes a manufacturing center. And this is extremely important because once we start to become a manufacturing center and we get a, a, a workforce that is, that is reasonably skilled in modern methods, and uh, then that, that's, there's a snowball effect. More people are going to move in here. Samuel Colt eventually in the 1840s is going to look at coming back to Hartford because he's going to see an area with a really highly educated workforce, right? He also wanted to rub, his, rub it in everybody's noses because when his father went bankrupt and all the people in Hartford, they just treated him badly and, yeah. It's always good to be able to, yeah. Hartford also is going to become a banking center as are all the, the banks are all going to be in the major cities. Um, again, to get a bank charter, uh, you, you, you had to go before the, uh, the legislature, the General Assembly, and the charter essentially said, you can raise $500,000, this is what your stock is going to cost, this is what you can do with your money, this is, you can only declare a dividend of so much. So it was, it was a rather complex process. Uh, the Hartford Bank, I think, was the second or third bank chartered, uh, and uh, it's, it's a very slow process. You can see it's by 1833, there's only four banks been chartered. And that's, that's because the people who are, that own the stock in these banks are the wealthy individuals. And again, this is that capital accumulation. As people are making more money in one area, they're able to invest it in another area. Uh, in 1825, uh, one of the largest banks in New Haven went under. Uh, they were supposed to have about $800,000 in assets, and when they opened the vaults, they were empty. Just like nothing there. Uh, so after that, the, the, the legislature stopped issuing charters. Uh, I'm surprised that the Mechanics Bank actually got, they actually issued a few here. But after 18, from 1835 to about 1860, they issued very few. But in the meantime, they actually created a commission to manage the bank so that they didn't have to do all this. Because one thing government's really good at is, is sloughing off their responsibilities, right? Well, in a bureaucracy, you can't be responsible for everything. Okay, so uh, insurance is exactly the same way. This is capital accumulation. If we were to go back to Hartford in, say, the 1820s and look at who owned stock in the uh, Hartford Railroad Company, in, in the Turnpike Company, who were the stockholders in the banks and the insurance companies, we would find a dozen or so names of, like, holy cow. <laughs> This guy has his finger in every pie, but it's because the people that were wealthy, they, they had the money, and every time there was an opportunity to invest, they would. So um, insurance is hard to figure out, but 1810 is really the Hartford Fire Insurance Company is actually the first. Um, 
1835 there was a fire in New York and early on insurance companies uh, you know it, it's Insurance companies say they have they have a lot of money put aside. The, you know the, the the standard for an insurance company is they always take about ten percent and they have that in reserve. And you know over a, a couple hundred years of ten percent in reserve is is a lot of a lot of money there. So uh, they they can take a hit. But if you can imagine an insurance company that's only about twenty odd years old and you have a fire where where you you're, you essentially could be wiped out, this could be devastating. And once again, if somebody buys your services and it doesn't work the way they want to, they're not going to buy your services again. So so uh, what happens is uh, Alephalet Terry, uh, who is I think the president of the company, he actually goes to the, the banks and he gets a line of credit and he essentially tells everyone, you have a policy, you get paid. And so he, he, he put himself in uh, potentially serious debt, but what happened afterwards <laughs> is people were lined up to buy his insurance policies because they said, wow, this is a company that's a, and, and you wanted people to have a sense of, of the reliability of your company. You know, people are very used to seeing a factory close or a company come and go or those, you know, uh, um, Harold Hill type traveling salesmen, you know, they come to town and they sell you something and then they, they, they get out of town, right? Um, so uh, the idea was to give people a sense that, that, that your company was lasting forever. So we get the idea of the Etna, right? The volcano, right? How long has that been there? Millions of years, right? We are as, as reliable as the Etna. You know, today you've got, is it Prudential? Solid as a rock. That's the rock of Gibraltar, right? The rock of Gibraltar, yeah. So we, we start to get, and, and you probably all remember Nabisco, National Biscuit. Everybody shredded. We'd always had Niagara Falls up in the corner, right? Niagara Falls was their symbol of enduring, right? This this company is here forever. So at any rate, so we we start to get this this idea out of this. Uh, 1846, we see Connecticut Mutual. 1851, the Phoenix. Although they didn't build that ridiculous building for. Yeah, it seems like last time I got farther into this, didn't I? All right, let's let's do bridging the river, and maybe that's a good place to. Okay, 1810 they built built the first bridge. Uh, in 1818 it was washed away. Uh, I don't have an image of the first bridge, but I'm pretty sure that you would have. Yeah. Uh, so they're they're going to build a, a much better bridge. Uh, they built actually a covered bridge, which is those trestles, it was much stronger. It wasn't apt to fall down. It wasn't apt to be washed away. Unfortunately, it was made out of wood. And, and uh, uh, before electricity, the way it was lighted is you had lanterns. <laughs> I, I, I'm surprised it, it took till 1895 for someone to knock the lantern down and for the, for the bridge to actually burn. So in 1908, they built the Buckley Bridge, which had its anniversary centennial not too long ago. They lit it up. I don't know if there was like Christmas tree lights on it all year. I don't know if you saw that or not. My cousin works for Riverfront Recapture, so he, he knew all that stuff anyway. Um, the Charter Oak Bridge is going to be built in the, in 1940s. Again, that connects you know Route 15. And, and then the Founders opens in 1858. At the same time, there was always a pretty active ferry service uh, crossing the river. Samuel Colt had built, a, he, he had a free ferry service for his workers. So if you worked at Colts, uh, you could live in, in East Hartford across the river and you could get to work every morning. You didn't have to worry about ice in the river or did the bridge burn down. It was, it was uh, uh, easy to, uh, uh, to get back and forth. So I, we're out of time. I think you can go a little longer. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. I have to get my daughter. You have to go, yeah, you have to go. Oh, okay. It's two o'clock right now, so. Oh, oh, it's two, oh, okay, we got time. Yeah. Okay, let's keep going. I'll just talk faster. <laughs> okay. All right, so Hartford is going to become an industrial city. Uh, early on, early industry is all about textiles. Um, and, and here in Connecticut, woolen mills were more popular than cotton mills for a couple reasons, at least initially. Uh, for one thing, we you know wool we can get wool from around here. We don't have to we don't have to have brokers going south for it. Uh, also, until it was a little while into the uh, the industrial revolution when uh, they started to make machines that wouldn't break the cotton thread because cotton thread snaps pretty easily. Um, so woolen mills and I, 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 if you remember woolen long underwear from you know my grandfather always wore it nine months a year. So, uh, but also saddles, friction matches, friction matches became very popular about 1830. Uh, 
what did they call them? Devils, Satan's, they some. Yeah. A lot of people thought it was mysterious that you could just go on the seat of your pants and it would light, right? When I was a kid, I squeezed the friction match and I have, I have a little scar on my finger because it went <laughs> and I was really surprised. <laughs> uh, firearms, uh, early in the Industrial Revolution, we see firearms and clocks are the, are the two, uh, the, the first two uh, mechanical uh, uh, objects that are, that are uh, um, manufactured uh, in, in part because everybody wants to know what time it is, right? Uh, in the old days, uh, this was what was considered a clock. It's called a tall clock or grandfather clock. Um, if I were a clockmaker, I'd make three or four of these guys a year, which meant they were really expensive. Uh, and let's face it, if, 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 if you have a beautifully appointed home, if this is, you have a place for it, if you're living in a little cabin in the frontier, <laughs> you don't have any place to put that. So we, uh, uh, you know, the shelf clock is, is, a, is a great invention because everybody has a mantle over their fireplace. So, so clocks are actually gonna be the first, uh, but firearms, because they have screws and springs and little tiny pieces and mechanical operations, they're very similar. So the firearm industry is gonna develop here in Connecticut, uh, certainly with uh, uh, Eli Whitney, right? and then eventually with Samuel Colt. What's going to happen, though, is that a lot of this especially, if I'm doing stuff by hand, if I have a lathe and I'm turning barrels and cutting my own springs, that's, that's time consuming. Uh, one of the things that we miss in industrialization is the machines that either make the parts or make other machines even. So, uh, so when, when screw machines are invented, and Eli Whitney did a lot of work with this, a lot of the people that worked for uh, Colt, Francis Pratt and Amos Whitney, they were, they were just absolute geniuses at, at creating the machines that made the pieces and parts, right? Uh, so eventually in Hartford, we're gonna see typewriters. Right, I still have an old Royal in my attic. Pianos. Bicycles and even brushes. I know you all remember Fuller Brush, right? I don't even try to explain that to college kids. Yeah, all right. Uh, the Sharps Rifle Company. This is a uh, Sharp started somewhere else, uh, but eventually moves into Hartford. Uh, uh, Capitol Avenue used to be called Rifle Avenue because about where the armory was, uh, was where his, uh, well the armory was here and then right next to that was, was Sharps and then it ended because the river actually came through, right? If, see this, this is what Hartford should look like except in the 40s they put it underwater, right? So uh, he had 25 acres on uh, Rifle Avenue which was Capitol Avenue and this was, this was when Trinity was still there so the state capitol wasn't there which is why it wasn't called Capitol Avenue, right? Uh, this was a breech loading gun the old the muskets, you know, you had to put the powder and the shot in this way and pound it down, and then you had to cock it, you had to prime the pan. That took at least 20 seconds, and if you're fighting, if somebody's running at you and shooting at you, uh, 20 seconds might be might seem like an eternity, right? Uh, breech loading meant that you could load it from this end, you could put it in the cartridge in the ball, and there was a little cap you put on, you could probably load it in five or six seconds. Eventually, what, when, when Colt comes, he actually puts the whole bullet together and then you get the six shooter and then you can just fire off six, six shots easily. Or if you're in the old westerns, about 25 shots, if you ever notice in all of those. They, yeah, all right. So it used a percussion cap and powder cartridge. It was the best gun in the world and it was made right here in Hartford. Um, it was, it, this, was the, this was the gun that uh, um, Henry Ward Beecher was buying and shipping out to Kansas you know, bloody Kansas and all that. He, had, he was the minister of the Plymouth Congregational Church in Brooklyn. It was the largest church in America. And every Sunday he'd take up a special collection for Kansas and he, <laughs> he would buy uh, rifles. Uh, he would label them as Bibles because it would be kind of like insurrectionist or treasonous to be shipping, you know, rifles out to people that were, so, uh, so in Kansas, the Sharps rifle was known as the Beecher's Bible, right? Uh, the Sharps rifle was extremely popular during the Civil War with cavalry officers because it was it was light. It didn't have a really long barrel, but it was it was very easy. You could actually load it on horseback because you can't. I, I don't know how you could load a musket on horseback. I mean, cavalry officers have always either carried pistols or swords because you can't deal with all that stuff, right? Okay. Um, and then of course we have Samuel Colt. He invents the first revolver. Do we know the story of Colt? He goes to sea when he's about 14, 
because he flunked out of school and he was tired of working in his grandfather's shop. And um, while he's out to sea, he's watching the, the wheel turn back and forth and he gets the idea of a spinning cartridge uh, or spinning uh, chamber. Uh, so he, he carves one out of wood, a, a sample, comes home, shows it to his father. Uh, his father says, I think you're crazy, but actually his father pays a gunsmith $200 to actually make a prototype. And they fired it and it, it blew up and the gunsmith said, this is crazy. And his father said, I'm never giving you any more money. Um, but he persisted, right? Because it, it, it was a good idea. And when he eventually in the 1830s, when he starts building them in New Jersey, uh, he's able to sell some to the Texas Rangers who are fighting the Comanches. Uh, the bow and arrow is actually one of the first rapid fire weapons because while I'm loading my gun every 15 or 20 seconds, I, the other guy's just like, whew, right? So, uh, so the revolver actually gave the Texas Rangers, who were sort of the militia uh, at the time, uh, a great advantage. And, and suddenly a small group of Rangers could protect themselves against larger groups of Native Americans. So uh, by, the, by the Mexican War, uh, the army was really uh, hot for these guns, which is why he's gonna move to Hartford in, uh, in what, 1840s, and he buys land in the South Meadows and everybody says you're crazy because it floods all the time and he said no it doesn't and he built his factory and it flooded and <laughs> then he built the dike right yeah and and to keep the dike in place he had traveled uh, he and his wife had traveled to Europe and they had seen the dikes in in Holland uh, and, and they had uh, uh, they planted a, a wicker uh, what do you call it wicker um, go up the next slide I think it's on there yeah, okay, that's not it. Um, willow. They planted, yeah, they planted willow, little plants, and, uh, and every year they, uh, 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 he, he paid somebody to go in and cut down the bushes uh, and then they grow back up because the, the root system was going to hold the dirt in place, right? And about the third year, he's, he, guys are out there cutting it, somebody comes by and says, hey, what are you going to do with that scrap wood? And he says, oh, we're just going to burn it. And the guy said, could I have it? <laughs> He said, why? And he said, oh, because I make willow wear with it. I make, you know, like wicker chairs and, and uh, babies' cradles and picture frames. And Colt said, no. And he built his own factory and he hired uh, some German workers from, uh, 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 it was actually East, well, it was Prussia at the time, actually. Uh, do you know Hartford at all, Colt's, the, the, the Potsdam village? Yeah, that's where the German, he, the houses were actually, they look like little Swiss chalets because he wanted them to feel at home, right? So, uh, so here, he's one of those guys, you, you want to make you know, lemonade out of, out of your lemons. Here's a, a waste product. He actually made a fairly decent profit for a number of years uh, uh, making those products. So, uh, and again, uh, the machine tools are extremely important. Whatever Colt is doing with weapons is important, but he's not doing it without the ability to manufacture high quality weapons quickly and easily so all right so Colt is in the South Meadows uh, he uh, builds a, 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 an area for his uh, workers to work uh, uh, to live uh, he builds a school he builds a firehouse uh, he has a, a community garden he has a, a, a ferry boat system uh, he pays to have the, uh, the fire hydrants and the water put in um, so it's it's a uh, it's a uh, Living in Coltsville is a really good deal, right? Uh, he establishes the first uh, successful assembly line, but it's important to know that he did not employ the people. What he did is subcontractors came in and, uh, and, and they paid him or he paid them and then they hired people. So if I was working in Colts, I wasn't working for Samuel Colt, I might be working for you and you're a subcontractor that's making say the barrels or making uh, uh, the bullets or, or making uh, uh, the, the wooden handles, right? So, so there might be six or eight or 10 subcontractors, each one responsible for a different part of, of the gun. And, and so uh, you have, uh, several hundred people working there, but it's, 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 it's this coordinated effort, which I find pretty fascinating. Okay, let's see the next slide here. That maybe we're, yeah, South Meadows, uh, it's 250 acres. He builds a two mile river dike, uh, which includes the armory and Armsmere. Armsmere is that incredibly ugly house of his over in the, yeah, have we seen that? It's pretty dreadful. I mean. He and his wife traveled, and, and if they saw something that had like a witch's hat tower, they said, oh, we like that. And if they saw, he saw something else that had crenellated top, and it, So he just, he said to his architect, I want all these things. So you can't say, oh, it's a Queen Anne style, or it's a Victorian or Gothic or Romanesque. It's just like, 
Wow. All right. Uh, yeah, so Coltsville, there's housing stores, churches. Oh, here's the fire. Uh, no, that's, we're, we're good here. Okay. This, no, no, no go, go forward, go forward. Yeah. We already sort of talked about all the things in Coltsville. I just, okay. Uh, this is what it looked like inside. You have steam engines in the basement. You have all these leather belts running up and down, turning these shafts. Each shaft a, has a belt coming down to a machine. Each machine has a, has a, a, a clutch, right? So you, when you're getting ready to work, you, you engage it, and you do your work, and then you, you take it out of gear. Can you imagine how noisy it was? There were no safety goggles. Every one of the machines leaked oil. Um, no ventilation. It was, a, it was a very good deal working for Colt. Colt was, uh, he was an equal opportunity employer. Uh, he hired lots of German workers and Irish workers, uh, even African American workers, people that might have trouble getting jobs other places. Um, but of course the problem is going to be eventually, is the next slide going to be the fire? Here's the army bug. Let's see. If, okay. Yeah, this is what it looks like after February 1864. The whole, the whole East Armory burns down, and it burns down. Let's well, see, there's gunpowder. Uh, there's lots of cotton batting. Uh, there's there's uh, uh, gun stocks that have been painted with, you know, with highly, uh, uh, with chemicals. And then, of course, the floors are just are, are oily. Uh, the Hartford Fire Department, um, they didn't have ladders that would go up to the second floor. Uh, so lots of people jumped out of windows. Uh, it was winter time, and, and the, 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 the water systems coming out of the river, and because there was a lot of ice in the river, they couldn't. And, and when they put in the water mains, there were only three inch mains, whereas, like in West Hartford, they had like five inch mains, so they couldn't get enough water pressure. It was, it was an absolute disaster, which is why, in about two hours, it went from looking like it does now to looking like this. And you can see in here, if you could get a close up of this, what you're going to see is all burned remains of those leather belts and the shafts and all of the, all of the machinery and all that. Amazingly, only one person died. And he died because he went back in. A lot of the workers, once they got out, they went in and they were trying to save like uh, their own tools, uh, guns that were finished, parts, anything that was valuable. And the guy that died, he was actually in his fourth or third or fourth trip in, and he was up on the second floor, and, and the, everything just collapsed on him, and every, somebody yelled, hey, let's get out of here, and he was the only person that died. All right, I think I have to, I think we should probably. All right. Thank you very much. All right, well, awesome. one of these days, I'm going to get through one of these PowerPoints. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. <laughs>